Hello, my name is Diana Lopez, and I'm very thrilled to be a part of Del Mar College's 2021 Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. I would like to give a special thank you to Elizabeth Flores and Javier Morin for inviting me, but also for being uh, um, such a, a big part of the Mexican American Studies program at the school uh, and for promoting these studies, uh, not only at Del Mar, but in the Corpus Christi community. Uh, I'm speaking to you as a proud graduate of Del Mar College. I graduated in 1987. Uh, but also I'm speaking to you because I write fiction and much of my fiction takes place in Corpus Christi, my hometown. So I'm calling today's presentation, Viva Corpus Christi. And I'd like to reflect on how this city has shaped my identity as a Mexican American and how it has uh, you know, played a role in the stories that I write. So I thought that the best way to begin this exploration is to kind of think back to being a child growing up here and you know, what that experience was like. Uh, so I'd like to share with you a little slideshow uh, from my childhood. So when I was a kid, we really enjoyed, my family and I, going downtown, uh, downtown Corpus Christi, hanging out in the tea heads, especially where the roller skating rink was. Uh, we'd take our skates and we'd skate around, uh, or we'd take our bikes and we'd bicycle. Uh, but probably our favorite thing to do was to go fishing and see what we could catch. Uh, we were a very outdoorsy type of family. We loved going to the beach. Here's a picture of myself as a two-year-old with my dad. Uh, and so I've been going to the beach my whole life. Here's my youngest brother, um, my tias, my primas. And my dad always dreamed of having a boat. So he kept saving his money. And when I was uh, about, about 12 or 13, he bought his boat. And we had a lot of adventures uh, with that boat. We would take it out to the bay to go fishing. Fishing was a really big part of my childhood growing up. Um, in this picture is my, my sister, my two brothers. And we take it over to Lake Mathis to go water skiing, or at least to try and water ski. <laughs> we loved camping. We would go camping. That was our big um, vacation every year was to go camping. Uh, usually it was to Garner State Park, uh, but one year we went to Big Bend. And when we'd go camping, um, it was, uh, a whole group of us that would go camping, not just my family, but my aunts and my uncles and all my primos. And this picture uh, is, is a picture of me and my cousin Johnny, my cousin Marty, Terry, my brother Albert with the cowboy hat. And we love to go on our hikes and explore things, find some shady spots to rest or some really... Uh, scenic spots to take pictures. Uh, in this picture is, is my father, my mother, my brother Albert, my cousin Terry, myself, and my Aunt Beatrice. And to laugh <laughs> at our adventures. Uh, but what we really like to do was, you know, at night gather around the campfire and, and laugh, tell stories. We also, gathered together to celebrate Christmas. And every Christmas included uh, time with Santa Claus. And that was always like the highlight of our Christmas Eve. And again, it was the whole families together, all in one tiny house. Uh, sometimes there were too many of us. So we had kids, if you notice, uh, sitting on laps and you couldn't really walk around. You had to like step over people, but we didn't care. And you were never too young to sit on Santa's lap. And you were never too old to sit on Santa's lap.
mostly we just like hanging out together. Uh, this is my father with his four sisters, my tias. Uh, and here I am with my uh, primos on my mother's side. That's my grandma, Angie, in the middle. Um, here I am with my primos on my father's side. Now, there's just too many of us to count. Uh, but we always like to hang out together when we had a chance. And I loved hanging out with my sister, Trisha, and my two brothers, Albert and Stephen. And that's how we spent our days. We spent our days together outdoors, at the beach, camping, barbecuing, sharing meals, and talking. And none of these things is specifically Mexican-American, but it is a big part of, of how I grew up. And so a lot of times when I think about my cultural heritage, the first thing that comes to mind, it, it's always family. A lot of times when I think about my heritage, I think about language, I think about Spanish, and I think about how I cannot speak Spanish. Um, I remember my grandfather, uh, he could understand English, but he preferred to speak in Spanish. And so we would have these kind of like half conversations when we talked. Uh, and it's true that um, there's a lot of research that shows uh, that um, when people come to the United States, and it doesn't matter what country they come from, but when they come to the United States, they speak their home language. Uh, and then they have children, and their children uh, are bilingual, speaking the home language in English. But then they have children, and their children um, speak mostly only English. And so you have these whole groups of people who cannot have conversations with their grandparents. And this was something that I kind of felt when it came to my grandfather trying to talk to him. And we did a lot of sign language and, and a lot of kind of, you know, I could understand some of the words that he said, um, and, but it was really hard to have a, a real conversation. And so this kind of language struggle is something I explore in my novel, Lucky Luna, which is, uh, it, it's, it's about a lot of things, but one of the things it's about is a girl who, uh, she's really embarrassed because she can't speak Spanish. Uh, and she's got a grandmother who's a Spanish only speaker. And Luna loves, uh, you know, visiting her grandmother, talking to her and, 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 in, and looking for some wise advice, she says, you know. Uh, and so here's a little excerpt about um, Lucky Luna doing that, going to her abuela, you know, and her abuela giving her some advice. And here's what Luna thinks about it. She says, when I hear Spanish, it sounds something like this. Let's go, blah, 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 or blah, blah, cookies, blah, blah. So when Abuela gives me her wise advice, I hear blah, 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 water. I try my best to translate, and only one thing makes sense. She's telling me I should drink water when I'm mad about Claudia. And that's a, a, a kind of an approximation of what it's like for me when I'm speaking Spanish to people. Um, I understand maybe between 30 to 40% of what I hear. And I have to use a lot of context clues to try to figure out the missing parts. Uh, it, it's very embarrassing when I'm in a group of people and, and someone's telling a joke in Spanish and I'm always the last one to get the joke because uh, I have to take moments to process the language, you know? So I hear the words and some Spanish words I, I don't have to process, but there's a lot of the words that I have to like think, okay, I hear it in Spanish. What does that mean in English? Oh, it means this. And at the same time, I'm looking at facial expressions. I'm looking at the reactions of the people around me. Uh, a lot of the Spanish I hear is Spanglish. So there probably is gonna be English mixed in. But it takes me, you know, a few seconds to kind of process what I'm hearing. And a lot of times I misunderstand what I hear. Uh, and I feel like I'm, I'm a little bit left out of the loop. And, and so this kind of language issue for me is a, it can be a real frustration. Uh, but also, you know, kind of going back to my grandfather, uh, I think about, I, I think about, you know, the, the wonderful conversations I've had with other people in my family, but the conversations I, I might have missed out on because uh, we, we didn't really speak the same language. And that saddens me. 
And so that language topic comes up again and again in my writing. Uh, and, and, and in a lot of my stories, the, the protagonist doesn't speak Spanish, but the elders around her do. Uh, and she's kind of like in Luna situation. Uh, but sometimes it's just a reflection of language. I, I wanna share this excerpt from a short story I wrote called Morning People. Um, and it's a story about a family that travels from Corpus Christi to Yellowstone Park. And the protagonist is you know, entering the park and, and seeing the beauty for the first time. We enter Yellowstone Park and there are elk, bison, and so many birds. I have no words, only words born here, native to this land and the people who once lived here could describe how beautiful it is. English doesn't cut it. Maybe Spanish does, but all I know are nouns. Tierra, árbol, cielo. I blame my parents. Their style of teaching was pointing at things and asking me to repeat. Mesa, piso, ventana. But they never actually spoke to me in Spanish. Never challenged me with sentences. No one ever did. That's the power of American English. It pushes other languages aside. And now we'll never know the words for this beauty. And so that's very much my experience. It's like, you know, I, I might know a lot of nouns, but I, I don't really know how to, you know, put, put words together uh, into sentences. And so, you know, um, I asked my parents, you know, why didn't you, you know, speak Spanish to us? There was this, you know, we would sit around the dinner table uh, and a lot of times, you know, my parents wanted to talk to each other, but they didn't want their children to know what they were saying. So they would start talking in Spanish. And, you know, that's when we started paying attention because we're like, ooh, there's some juicy gossip, or there's some kind of secret or something's going on. Uh, and so in one sense, uh, I felt excluded by um, the people around me speaking Spanish, but, but also Spanish really took on this kind of magical you know, it was kind of like this mystery, magical language, you know, that I didn't quite have access to. Um, but it was a deliberate choice uh, of my parents to not speak to me in Spanish. Uh, and so I just uh, published a book. It's my first picture book. It's called Sing With Me, the Story of Selena Quintanilla, another person from Corpus Christi. Uh, and she... Uh, was a little bit younger than me, but not, not by much, just by a few years. Uh, also somebody you know, who, who you know, grew up in, in Texas around the same time, didn't grow up speaking Spanish. Uh, and so when I was writing the book, you know, I had to kind of like use a little bit, a little bit of creative license and, and, and think about my own experience and how maybe her experience was the same. Uh, and so, um, the answer that my parents gave me is, is kind of an answer that I, I put in my picture book. And so I just wanted to share this page with you uh, from that book. Oh, why didn't you teach me Spanish? Selena asked her parents. They were quiet for a moment. Then her father said, when we were growing up, we got punished if we spoke Spanish in school. That's why we taught you only English. At the time, it was a language of schooling and success. Selena understood that her parents thought they were helping her, but she really wanted this connection with her audience. I'm going to learn Spanish, she decided, so more people can sing along. Um, and so this was the answer my parents gave me, uh, you know, speaking to a lot of my friends and things that they're in the same situation. Uh, it's really sad to, to learn that, you know, a whole generation of people was shamed out of their language and, and, and punished for their language. And then so you have a whole generation like me that, that has kind of lost touch with that. And so that's one of the themes that frequently comes out when I'm writing my stories. What is my character's connection to language? Uh, you know, and, 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 and it's, it's a problem for some characters and some characters just live with it, you know, um, but it always seems to be there as part of the story is like, how does this character connect to language and how does this character connect to, to Spanish?
But I want to spend a little time talking about my book, um, Confetti Girl. It's my first middle grade novel. Uh, and it's about a girl who lives in Corpus Christi. <laughs> and so I really do think it's as much a book about Corpus Christi as it is about Lena, my main character. Um, when I was writing it, and, and, and this is how it is when you write stories, you're writing about a character, you're writing about a person, um, you know, they're in a situation and they're trying to cope with it. And in this situation, and like my character's mother has died a, a year before the story begins. Uh, and Lena's um, trying her best to move on, but her father is kind of stuck in his grief. And so, you know, part one of her challenges, one of many is just trying to help her father you know, kind of, kind of get out of his grief and move forward with life. Uh, and so I wrote it. She goes to Baker Middle School, you know, she goes and eats at Snoopy's. I mean, there's a lot of like um, very familiar places, uh, if you know, in Corpus Christi in this book. And um, her father loves to, to read and he's an English teacher at, the high, at Ray High School. Uh, and so when I was writing this, this story, I started to think about teachers that I've known over the years. And, and I remembered one of the teachers that I worked with at, at Horseman Middle School in San Antonio. He would always stand at the door when the kids were coming into class and um, he, he'd always have a dicho, you know, he'd always have a dicho. Uh, sometimes he didn't have a dicho, but he'd be like, dale shine, you know, and he was just always had something to say to the kids. And so when I was, you know, imagining Lena's father, I had him say a few details. They didn't have him say a whole lot, just a few. Uh, but when I was trying to get the book published, this was one of the things that my editor kind of thought, these are interesting, these details are interesting. Uh, and she said, do you think you can, you can find a detail that, you know, kind of like as a chapter heading for every chapter? And there were, there's more than 20 chapters in the book, you know, and so I didn't know that many details. <laughs> really, I only, the one that I knew was um, uh, the one, Panza Yena Corazón Contento, that's the one I knew. Um, so I did some research and a lot of my research was just, you know, an email blast to, to family and friends and, and send me your dichos. Uh, and I also found out that there were like dicho dictionaries that, and, and there is a dicho for almost every situation you can think of. Uh, and so I didn't really have to change the story. Um, I was able to find the detail that was, you know, appropriate for every chapter. Uh, and in the back of the book, um, because then we thought, well, this would be kind of cool. Let's create a detail dictionary, uh, a glossary of the details that are uh, in the book and, and, and with the translations. Uh, and so that kind of became part of this book. Um, Another thing that, that comes out in this book, I mean, it's called Confetti Girl because one, one of the characters, her mother, has a cascarones making obsession. Now, I didn't originally plan to put cascarones in this book. You know, I was I actually got to a point where I was a little bit stuck. I was trying to envision uh, Selena's best friend's house. Um, and I was really just struggling with the imagery. Uh, but then I, you know, just driving around town uh, I saw a lady <clears throat> down my street. She was in a rocking chair and she had dozens and dozens of, of cascarones beside her with a sign that said cascarones for sale. And I thought to myself, how many eggs did that lady have to eat to make all those cascarones? You know, and I just started laughing because I just imagined that this, this woman, you know, is making all these cascarones and, and she needs the eggshells. So of course she's eating eggs, you know, and she's making her poor daughter eat eggs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and, um, and I just thought it was fun. Um, when I was growing up, my mother would start collecting the eggshells around January. And I remember, you know, at that point, it was like when you crack the egg, you had to crack it on the top, not in the middle. Uh, you had to wash the eggshell and then put it back in the carton. And I would see the carton start to add up on top of the refrigerator as we save the eggshells. Uh, and so then it would get close to Easter time and my family would gather around the table and we would make our cascarones. And this was always for me, the fun part of the tradition was the actual making of the cascarones. We paint the eggs, we cut out the tissues, uh, and one of the things that we would do is we would make our own confetti with a hole punch. My mother would save her magazines and newspapers 
I mean, it just never, I don't even know if they sold confetti back then. It just never occurred to us that you could buy confetti. Uh, and so we would just, with the hole punch, you know, it was a single hole punch making the confetti and gathering, and you know, your hand would start to get tired and kind of cramp up. But when I was writing the book, Confetti Girl, I just had this image of this woman making confetti, but she's angry, you know, and I wanted to know why she was angry. And, and, and out of that image, this, this character was born. Um, but, you know, it, it first it started as a setting detail and, and then it kind of, it, it kind of gave birth to this, this character and, and her problem. But as I kept writing the book, this idea of Cascarones kind of took on greater significance. It's not a real big part of the story, but the story does end with Cascarones. You know, at the very end, there's a big Cascarones war and celebration. There's confetti being thrown up everywhere. And I just started to think about, you know, in the context of this story, how um, how special Cascarones are, you know, and, and, and just how much time it took for us to make them, you know, starting with the saving of the eggshells and, 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 and that actual construction day. And yet, that one cascaron that took so long to make it was it, it cracks in an instant, and um, and I think that's that's kind of how life is sometimes. You know, uh, everything's going along, you're building up to something, and, and and something can happen to just make your life crack in an instant. But there's this other part to, uh, to cascarones that in that cracking, you know, there's this colorful confetti, and there's smiles, and there's laughter, and there's joy. Uh, and I think they're really a really special part of my growing up, you know, and I was so happy to put them in this book. Um, you know, I didn't realize, uh, I mean, I guess I knew, but I didn't really quite know just how much of a regional thing Cascarones are because, you know, when I sent my book uh, over to New York, um, the editors, they were very curious about the Cascarones. They wanted pictures. They wanted me to send them instructions. And in fact, uh, we put the instructions on, you know, on how to make them in the very front of the book. So people that are not familiar with the practice can make them. Um, and I really do think that it was a cascarones that got me a contract to publish this book. So, you know, something that uh, was a part of my childhood um, that I grew up with that I didn't, you know, I thought was special, but I didn't think it was unique. Uh, it was unique, you know, it was unique to, uh, to people in other parts of the country. And so I've really enjoyed sharing this tradition with readers and other states uh, and, and hearing from them uh, just how much fun they had the first time they got to experience uh, the wonderful joy of crack, cracking cascarones on your friends' heads. <laughs> A lot of times when I think about my heritage, I think about my Catholic heritage and, and all the traditions that we had. Um, and whenever somebody got sick or, or was in trouble, one of the things that we did was we, we would make promesas, uh, promises to God in exchange for his help. Uh, and so, um, it was a, that's a tradition that I kind of brought in and this middle grade book that I wrote called Ask My Mood Ring How I Feel. It's a story of a girl whose mom has been diagnosed with cancer and the family uh, like my family, makes a journey to the valley uh, where they visit um, the shrine. I'm going to share this with you. I'm going to guess that many of us here, if we haven't exactly been to the shrine, we know where it is. It's in San Juan. Here's what it looks like. And, um, and when I was, while I was writing the book, I actually also wrote an essay because I, I decided that... Um, you know, as many times as I've been there, I wanted to just go back and visit it with the writer's mind, um, you know, take some notes and, and try to make it come as alive as I could in my story. Uh, and so I wrote an essay about the experience called El, El Cuarto de los Milagros. Uh, here's, what, here's what it looks like inside. And so let me just read you an excerpt of this essay. Last spring, my mother and I drove past the Chapman and King Ranches in South Texas, past Raymondville, past the trees at Line 77 before the turnoff to 83. I was writing a novel inspired by the tradition of promesas, and I wanted to send my editor pictures of El Cuarto de los Milagros, the miracle room, where the faithful leave offerings, 
crutches, splints, braids, wedding veils, dog tags, purple hearts, trophies, baby shoes, toys, roses, reeds, photos, hundreds of photos and letters voicing gratitude and please, ayúdame, por favor. I first made this trip after Grandpa Lupe's stroke. I was in the fourth grade when my family jumped into our suburban and drove to this shrine for La Virgen de San Juan del Valle. Mom bought candles at the gift shop and for me, a Saint Christopher that pretended to be gold. I don't remember the church, only a room with rows of cafeteria chairs upholstered in red vinyl and a man clasping a rosary as he walked on his knees. His pants were already torn at the kneecaps and a smear of blood trailed him the way slime trails snails. What inspired him to wound himself this way? I didn't understand, but how I tried and how I spent years trying. Pray for your grandpa, mom instructed. Tell God you'll do something special if he helps. I made the sign of the cross and silently said, dear God, if you help grandpa, I'll do something special. It sounded like a bribe to me, but what did I know? Besides, why would God help us, even if I promised the most difficult task in exchange? After all, he was busy with the galaxies and wars, with the hurricanes brewing in the Gulf. He had so much on his mind already. I must have seemed worried because mom said, God hears you. And she put her hand on my shoulder to reassure me. That's when my father stepped in with a story about an uncle who had polio, how this uncle promised to let his hair grow for three years if God cured him, and how this uncle's hair got long all during the 40s when men weren't supposed to have long hair. So he was kicked out of school for the scandal, but he endured, and in return, God cured him. It was a miracle, Dad said. And so the story of the miracle of... Um, of the church, you know, uh, happens in, in 1970. Um, there was a, a, a suicidal pilot who deliberately crashed his plane onto the, the existing church at the time. It was a different building. And uh, he did so while they were having mass. There were like 100 people inside the church. But the plane landed in such a way as um, it didn't actually go into the church it was kind of like on top of the church and it caught on fire uh and luckily everybody was able to escape the only person who died was the pilot uh and so it was called a miracle you know and my parents are oh when they would tell me the stories they would say but the little statue of la Vitin survived uh, and so that's what I grew up hearing was that, you know, this church caught on fire, but this little statue of La Virgen survived. So when my parents told the story, I, I saw the arms of fire lashing out like the arms of El Pupui, for that was how I had imagined him. My parents said, everything burned down, everything but the statue. So then I imagined La Virgen quaking in fear, but protected by a flame retardant bubble, a gift from God. Then the aftermath, priests, nuns, and firemen poking through the rubble, crying perhaps, but eventually finding her, La Virgen, totally unscathed, not even sooty. I trusted this story until Belinda, a girl on my seventh grade basketball team, died in a fire after her father's cigarette ignited the couch. Her house burned down with Belinda and her sister trapped inside. For this, I was told that God had his plan. And his plan was to leave grandpa alone, for he remained paralyzed and unable to speak. And the Saint Christopher medallion that I treasure turned green. Later, much later, I probably was in college at the time, I learned that no magic protected La Virgen de San Juan on that October day when the pilot crashed his plane. A priest, Father Patricio Dominguez, had grabbed the little statue before he ran out of the church. Uh, and so, um, you know, the essay goes on, but it's kind of like an exploration of this story and what it means to me and, and you know, um, 
but it's also kind of an exploration of my faith and, and, and just how, how big a role growing up Catholic played. Uh, and, and, and it, to me, um, growing up Catholic is very intertwined with growing up Mexican. You know, I, I have a hard time separating the two because they were very much um, part, of, part of the same thing. Uh, and so um, my character explores this in the book, Ask My Mood and How I Feel. Uh, and her experience uh, is, is kind of like mine when I was a young girl, you know, like just asking myself, you know, is this true? Does this really work? And then, and then, you know, while I'm praying, I'm actually like starting to daydream and then I'm feeling guilty because I'm not focusing on my prayers and, and things like that. Uh, but that's another part of my heritage that I wanted to share with you. One of the things that uh, I want to discuss is when did I become aware of myself as a Mexican American? Because when I was very young, I, I, didn't, I didn't think of my identity in those terms. It actually wasn't until I was in third grade when I started to like think of myself as belonging to like a specific cultural group. And that's because, um, you know, I, I went to, I was going to school at Sam Houston Elementary there on Norton Street. Uh, and then I was told that for the third grade, I was going to have to go to Travis Elementary, which is across the street from Christ the King, the church that my family went to. And I didn't understand why I have to why did I have to go to this other school? You know, I was already comfortable at Sam Houston. It's I could walk there. You know, it was it was less than half a mile from my house. Uh, I didn't understand. And so my parents, you know, they were telling me that it was because of this busing program that the school district was trying to mix like the brown, black and white people all together. And, and they use the word desegregation, which I didn't quite understand what that meant, you know? Uh, and I can't say that going to Travis clarified it for me because one, I wasn't bused there. It was within two miles of my house. And so my parents had to drive me. So it, it just ended up being like, Instead of walking, I was being driven to school and was, it was an inconvenience. But two, when I went to Travis Elementary, everybody in my class was brown. I, I, there was no mixing of anybody. And so that was very confusing to me. Later, you know, much, much later, I, I learned about Cease Nettles versus the Corpus Christi Independent School District and, and, and that this was an attempt to kind of like um, address some of those uh, issues but I didn't really see how it worked out. Uh, then in the fourth grade, uh, I went to Windsor Park Elementary, which was on the other side of town. And I was there for a gifted and talented program that they were starting. That is when I first started to feel, um, I, I started to feel like, like I was different than other people. Uh, the word that was being used was minority. I was a minority. Uh, and that's actually where I first started really hearing the word minority. But it wasn't so much that, you know, I was Mexican American that made me feel kind of like different. It had a lot more to do with a, a lot of people at that school. They had more money than me. And so they were, you know, they had exposure to different things. So I remember I used to wear these beautiful blouses that my mother would embroider for me because she always wanted my clothes to be like one of a kind. So she might embroider a little flower or sometimes my name, or she would just add a little personal touch. All of my school clothes were made by my mom. And a big joy of mine was going with her to the fabric stores, choosing the patterns, choosing the material, choosing the buttons, you know, and, and having those discuss discussions about clothing and then just watching my mother sew and sitting beside her and learning how to sew myself. That was a really special part of my childhood. So I'm in school and, um, and some girls asked me, you know, what brand is that? What brand are your clothes? Where do you buy your clothes from? And I said, Oh, I, you know, my mother made this. And I said it with a lot of pride, um, but their response was your mother made that, you know, you can't afford to buy clothes. And I never really thought that way, you know, I was very proud of my, I was very proud of having unique clothes that my mother made. I didn't know anything about designers, nothing. Uh, and they made me feel less than. 
Uh, and so that was kind of like where some insecurity started to, to, to creep into, you know, my little side, my psyche and stuff. Um, later, I started to hear about affirmative action. And it was always like, oh, you're so lucky because of affirmative action. You've been given this opportunity and that opportunity, and this wasn't available to you before and stuff. Um, but the subtext was always that, you know, if I was given an advantage or, or admitted into a special program, it was because they were somebody somewhere was making an exception for me, not that I really belong there. So I kind of grew to really hate affirmative action because uh, it also planted a little seed of doubt. Do I belong here? And made me feel like I didn't. Um, and so this kind of like, you know, maybe a little darker side of growing up, Mexican American in Corpus Christi at the time that I did, uh, there were instances where I kind of felt uh, insecure and just wondering, am, am I measuring up? And so these feelings are something that I, uh, that I sometimes explore in my fiction. I want to share with you a story that I recently had published uh, in an anthology. And the anthology is uh, called uh, Nepantla Familias. Um, and the story that I have in here it's called Dutiful Daughter. Uh, so I'm just gonna read a couple of pages because they kind of explore this, these emotions that I was dealing with um, early on. After work, Juanita headed to the Molina where she lived with her teenage brother and her parents. Still lived, she thought. She took the Greenwood exit. There weren't any woods and the grass wasn't green and neither were the weeds. Most of the restaurants were mom and pops and a lot of businesses were this and that types, what her brother called hybrids, a car wash and a pet store, a tire shop and a taqueria, a laundromat with dryers for clothes and hair. I know it's strange, but this hood was good enough for Selena, Juanita said, defending out loud, though no one had objected because no one was in the car. She got to the house, idled out front, and honked so her mom could open the chain link fence that blocked the driveway. Her mother ran out, cell phone to ear. She unlatched the gate, leaving it open after Juanita drove in, all the while talking to someone. Yes, yes, Juanita's got a good job, she heard her mother say as they stepped into the house. At Spawn, her mother continued. She wears those medical pajamas like the doctors. She had to go to college. All of it was true, but listening, Juanita felt like a fraud. When her mom hung up, she said, I didn't technically graduate. I got a certificate, not a degree. I, mija, her mother said, what's the difference? But there was a difference between certificate and degree, between LVN and RN, between phlebotomist and med tech. Still, she couldn't blame her mom for not knowing or not wanting to know because Juanita also pretended. And not just about her job, but about her parents' jobs too. When people asked, she said her father worked at a school. And because she didn't want to sound like someone showing off, she added that it was an elementary school. That's where she left off, like a giant fill in the blank on a homework page. She hoped those nosy people concluded that he was a teacher or better, a principal. He's been, with the 20 he's been with the district for 20 years, she'd say, thinking that 20 years should be enough for someone to move up. The 20 years part was true. The moving up was not. Sometimes she felt guilty for lying, but then she, remembered her, she reminded herself that she hadn't lied, had only implied, and couldn't be responsible for whatever conclusions people drew, yet hoping they drew the ones that had her father in front of students and faculty, wearing a suit and being called Mr. Ariaga or Dr. Ariaga, anything but Joe, which is what they called him, the administration, the faculty, the secretary and attendance clerk, the kids, even those in pre-K. The truth, her father was a custodian at Barnes Elementary on the other side of town. To get there, he turned on a street called the Mansions, and even that was a lie because there weren't any mansions, just as there weren't green trees along Greenwood. The mansions was lined by rows of townhomes, each unit narrow and tall. Maybe the neighborhood near her father's school was better, 
but maybe it only seemed better because there weren't any mattresses or sofas out front. Juanita wasn't ashamed of her father. He was a good, hardworking man. He had the keys of the school. He was the first to open and the last to close. And if there was an assembly or PTA meeting, he stayed, making sure the ladies were safely in their cars because he was old fashioned and never understood why some got offended when he held open a door or offered to lift heavy boxes. He cleaned the school and there was honor in that. Sometimes things broke and he fixed them. Juanita once asked, how'd you learn to fix those things? And he'd said, Wes, I just know, as though he had been born with the knowledge, the way he'd been born knowing how to breathe and suckle and cry. Her mother babysat, but when people asked, Juanita said she ran a daycare, though it was really a night care, because the parents in the neighborhood worked the registers at Valero or the front desk at Motel 6. They dropped off their children with sandwiches or Campbell's soup for dinner. Juanita's mom fed them, made them brush their teeth and put them to bed. She bought air mattresses, called them an investment. In the morning after the children left, she propped the mattresses against the wall. They'd be firm for a few days, but eventually the air leaked out and the sheets slipped off. Sometimes Juanita looked at those deflating mattresses and saw her own self losing air and sinking. And so that kind of theme of, you know, uh, feeling uh, like you had to prove yourself, feeling a little bit inadequate is something that, um, something that I experienced at times um, in Corpus Christi growing up. <laughs> so I've spent most of this presentation thinking about my childhood and how growing up in Corpus Christi has uh, informed my identity as a Mexican American. My primos and primas, they've moved on. They have their own families, their own jobs. Some of them, they don't even live in Texas anymore. Um, so we don't get together to go camping the way we used to or to celebrate Christmases the way they used to. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we've stopped celebrating because some good things have happened too. So I'm married now, this is my husband, Gene. And with him comes a whole new family to celebrate. Uh, our holidays with and, and to love. Uh, and so we've grown up. The son who was carried by his father is now the father carrying his son. And now I have new children in my life. I get to be, um, I get to be the Thea who takes the girls to Hurricane Alley or the one who acts silly with all her sobrinos. <laughs> And we're still doing the things that we love to do. We're still going to downtown Corpus Christi, visiting places like the Salina Memorial, or just walking the dog along the seawall. We're still going to the beach, this time with new people, but still with our families. We're teaching a whole new generation how to love things like fishing, like playing in the water. And we are going camping. We're still enjoying taking out the map, planning our day, going for walks in nature, finding those scenic spots to take our pictures. And we're still going as a big group with the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles and, and the kids. And we are cramming ourselves into one or two cars when we go on these trips. So naturally, it's not, we're not always a happy family. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we get on each other's nerves. We get a little irritated with each other. But all it takes is a beautiful scene like this to bring us back together and to remind us just how much we mean to each other and how special our family is. And so this trip to Yellowstone Park inspired a story that I wrote for this anthology that was just released in August. It's called Living Beyond Borders, Growing Up Mexican in America. And I just want to read you a little excerpt. Just like in my family, the characters in the story that, you know, it's their last day in Yellowstone that, you know, they, the day before they've had a big old argument, everybody's mad at everybody. It's still dark when Papa Grande wakes us the next morning. This time I don't complain. 
I don't say anything at all because I'm still too mad to speak. My uncle and my grandpa have pointed their headlights at the camp so we can finish packing. Mom and Aunt Ceci are ignoring each other and everyone's keeping my primo Fonzie and me apart. We can't even look at each other without a warning glance from someone. Then we head out, but we don't leave the park just yet. We head to the Yellowstone Hotel, which is by a lake. Papa Grande stops at a scenic overlook sign in the deck that faces east. I want to watch the sunrise, he explains. We line up at the rail, the water softly lapping beneath us. It's cold and dark, but we wait. Did we ever tell you how we fell in love? I groan, but Mama Grande begins and I hear the whole story again, how the trucks pick them up to go pick cotton, how they watched the sunrise on their way to Robstown, how beautiful it was when it gave its gold light to the fields. Again, no mention of the heat and bugs and blisters or of the reason they were picking cotton in the first place, because they were hungry and poor and of a time when Mexicans had few options, none of that. According to my grandparents, the cotton fields were as beautiful as any scenic spot along the roads of Yellowstone National Park. And when they tell the story, even though I know the harsh truths behind it, I imagine them working and falling in love while dancing in the clouds. Mira, Papa Grande says, pointing, to, pointing at the horizon, the first finger of the sun, See how it reaches for us? He puts his arm around, around Mama Grande and she leans into him. We watch the sun lighting the sky, one finger at a time, like the fist unfurling. Paul, Aunt Ceci says, shh, he answers, kissing her. Then my aunt again, hermanita? She's reaching for my mother. Uncle Paul and my grandparents are between them, but Mom stretches out her arm and takes her sister's hand. Fonzie and I are on opposite sides of all of this, but I lean forward and catch his eye. He smiles back at me. We will probably never be alone again. We'll move on, but I will always remember our last night in Yellowstone and that moment of sweet suspense. Mi familia, we watch the sunrise in a land so far away from our homes in Texas. I guess we're morning people after all. And so the story ends with a note of reconciliation. Uh, and, and it was just an understanding of just how special family is. The faces have changed, the times have changed, the children have grown up, but the traditions have stayed the same. And it's been such a pleasure to share those things that we loved as kids with our own kids. So when I think about um, my Mexican American heritage, it always comes back to family and to spending time with them and to, uh, to loving them, to forgiving them and asking for forgiveness. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Uh, I've absolutely loved uh, spending this time with you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You can always email me and I can be reached at dianalopezbooks at yahoo.com. And you can also learn more about me by visiting my website. It's www.dianalopezbooks.com. Thank you to everyone. And I wish all of you a wonderful Hispanic Heritage Month.